Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Andrew Aronson. Um, Andrew is an assistant professor of medicine in the Center for Liver Disease in the section of GI at the University of Chicago. Um, Dr. Aronson is also a faculty member at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. Um, he's the co-principal investigator of HEPCAT, which is a CDC-funded initiative to diagnose and treat hepatitis C in the Chicago area. Uh, this project utilizes telehealth technology to expand hepatitis C management into the primary care setting. Dr. Anderson runs a very busy clinical practice, including both general and transplant hepatology, and writes often in the field of ethics of transplantation. Today, Dr. Aronson will speak to us on the topic, the true cost of hepatitis C therapy. Uh, Andrew Aronson. Welcome. Thanks, Mark, um, for having me and inviting me. This is a great conference every year, and it's a real honor to be here and to uh, present some of this to you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, hepatitis C therapy, which you've probably heard a lot about in the news um, recently. Um, and my goal is to kind of give you a little bit of a background of what's going on in hepatitis C, but also identify some very unique uh, ethical issues um, that are happening at the same time. I don't have any uh, disclosures or conflicts of interest. So by means of a background, uh, hepatitis C uh, is uh, very, very prevalent both in the United States and worldwide. Uh, there's about 5 million people in the United States that are infected, about 180 million people in the world. And in the United States, it's the leading, leading cause of liver cancer, liver-related death, and transplantation. So really a huge uh, burden uh, to our society. Um, what's making this very interesting is that there's very, very new therapies that are very effective uh, that have come out in the last couple of years. Um, and this is really where the crux of these ethical issues is starting to come out. Um, so a lot of people say to me, so I specialize in hepatitis C, and a lot of people say to me, you know, I saw a commercial where now they can cure 99% of people with a pill. What, what are you doing? And I said, <clears throat> you know, that's a good point. Um, it is pretty easy. <laughs> it is a pretty easy thing to cure now. But I kind of refer people to this. So it turns out that since there's so many people that are undiagnosed and there are so many people um, that have it that have not been treated yet, um, we've actually only begin to see the mortality in our country that's related to hepatitis C. Um, you can see here by the year 2030 or 2035, we're expecting about 35,000 people a year to die of this disease. Um, this is actually a model, this is one of many models, but this model actually includes new therapies. So this is including all these people very easily being cured from this disease. Um, to kind of understand the ethics, uh, I do want to review just a little bit of the physiology of this disease and the pathophysiology of this disease. Um, hepatitis C progresses very, very slowly. So patients are infected with hepatitis C. The majority of these patients are going to develop a chronic infection. And over time, that inflammation of the liver will cause fibrosis. And over years, usually decades, that fibrosis will get worse and worse, um, which will uh, result in cirrhosis for most patients, for many patients. Um, once a patient develops cirrhosis, they're at risk of developing liver cancer, uh, they're at risk of decompensated liver disease, and they're at risk of dying from their liver disease. This entire process, in most cases, will take 20 or 30 years from the time of infection to the time uh, of patients having um, significant medical issues for it. Now, turns out that after all of this, hepatitis C is a very wimpy virus. It's very easy to cure. Um, it's not like hepatitis B or HIV where we suppress the virus or we kind of put it down for a number of years. You can actually cure hepatitis C, meaning that the virus can be completely eradicated with medical therapy. And SVR is a terminology that we use that stands for a sustained virologic response, and that's complete viral eradication. And when people have an SVR, of course, the virus goes away. That's the easy part. But what we know is actually the liver will get better in a lot of patients. So some of that scarring that I was talking about will go away. Um, and this results in improved clinical outcomes. So there's lots and lots of studies over the years that show when people have an SVR, their chance of their liver decompensated nearly goes to zero. Their chances of developing cancer nearly goes to zero. And all-cause mortality goes down, both liver-related and all-cause. So patients are going to significantly live longer if their virus gets cured. There's really no doubt about that. 
So we've come a long way in hepatitis C therapy. Um, and you can see, I, I, and this is going to be an important um, kind of graph to kind of put in your mind as I'm going through this, um, of how far we've come over the last 30 years. So back in the, uh, the mid-80s, um, the only therapy that was available was a drug called interferon. Um, and interferon is an injectable medication that is extremely toxic. So uh, if anyone here has had a patient or knows a patient that's been on interferon, it's almost always a miserable experience. There's flu-like symptoms, depression, uh, problems with blood counts. Patients really um, do very, very poorly. And in the mid-80s, uh, we, we knew very little about hepatitis C. Um, and interferon therapy, you'd make your patients miserable, and you'd only cure about 6% of them. So it wasn't so good. Um, this was tweaked over the years, and in the 90s, we used a different formulation of interferon. We added a medication called ribavirin. But even at the best, in the, and then this is in sort of the early 2000s, we were only able to cure about 50% of patients. And that's a, there's a caveat there that this is only the healthiest of those patients. So if you had any comorbidities going into it, you probably weren't going to be a candidate for therapy anyway. So this is a highly selected population. And of those, you made them miserable and um, you could only cure half of them. 2011 was a very big year in hepatitis C, and this was the year of the first direct-acting antiviral agent. So this is a drug that actually works on the virus itself. Everything we had prior to that would work on the host response, the patient's immune system, to fight the virus. This is the actually first directed therapy we had. And everybody was very, very excited because you can see this is our first big jump. So now we can cure 75% of patients. This is great. Uh, but you still needed interferon, you still needed ribavirin, and this drug itself happened to be very, very toxic. And if anyone is familiar um, with HIV therapy or took care of patients when the HIV was st first started to be treated, this was like the first generation of the antiviral, <laughs> of the, of the antiretroviral medications. It kind of worked, but really, really toxic. Um, and then fast forward to today. Um, and so in 2015, we have a therapy for most patients with hepatitis C that is one pill once a day with about a 90%, 90-95% cure rate. So essentially, we can almost cure everybody with a side effect-free medication that will um, that is very highly effective and extremely safe. So, where are the ethics here? This is this is great. This is you know this is success. This is modern medicine doing what it's supposed to be. And what I want to kind of propose to the group today is thinking a little bit about ethics of success. So when we think about some of the ethical questions that we deal with all the time, you know, they're really reflections of limitations of understanding that we have, whether it's understanding of uh, medical science or mechanisms of disease. Think of end of life issues. So when you're having an end of life issue with uh, uh, end of life discussion with a patient, ethical questions come out of, we really don't know what's going to happen to that patient. You know, we've reached the end of our therapy that we're able to save the patient. You know, we're dealing with our limitations, and that's when these questions come up. Even if you think about it, it maybe a bit of a stretch, but informed consent is actually acknowledging our limitations. We're saying, I'm proposing to do this procedure. You know, some stuff could happen. I'm not sure what it's going to be. There could be some complications. You could react a certain way to this procedure. I don't really know. It's acknowledging limitation. But what about when science wins? I mean, this is a win. Science has won. You know, we have got, come up with medications that have completely eradicated this disease, no side effects, easy to take. There's no reason why anyone that walks into my clinic can't be cured. Is there ethics when science wins? And I, I want to show you that there certainly is. So there's two bottlenecks. And a lot of these ethics, ethical issues of science winning really deal with resources and limitations of resources. And I want to tell you two stories um, one which happened in 2011, coinciding with that first jump, and the other one that's happening right now. So there are these two um, very uh, uh, telling issues of, of limitations of resources. So we'll go to a little bit of a historical break in 1922 uh, when insulin was discovered by Banting and Best. Um, and they were able to isolate insulin, insulin from livestock pancreas. And of course, here's a picture of them. There's only so many livestock pancreases that you can get your hands on in 1922. So there was a limitation. They could only make so much insulin. Um, so what happened? They were able to make insulin. It was working for diabetic patients. Their friends got it. Very well-connected people who could travel were able to get it. You know, so they, it was only sort of divvied out to these people. So as fast as they can make it, just kind of this highly selected group were able to get it. And of course, this violates justice. 
you know, certainly patients didn't have equal access to this medication who needed it. Um, and also you can make an argument this violates utility, right? You're not necessarily doing the greatest possible good with this limited resources. You're sort of giving it to your friends, which um, is, I think, sort of morally questionable. Uh, way of distribution. So we had an issue in 2011. We had what I call distributive justice uh, issues in, in hepatitis C in 2011. So this new medication was approved. This is, again, remember the jump from 50% to 75%. This was the first of this very new class of drugs. Response rates were, were increased uh, significantly. Um, and of course, this is now 19, not 1922. You know, the pharmaceutical companies that made this, there was warehouses of this stuff ready to go on the day that the FDA approved it. So there was certainly not a production issue uh, in the modern time. But there was a cost. So these medicines are very, very toxic. And it was very, it took, it was very time consuming both to get the medicines for patients and to manage them while they were on therapy. So if I was going to see a patient, it would require a lot of clinic visits, a lot of phone calls talking about side effect management, a lot of time. And, and at the time, from our own experience here at University of Chicago, we had about 500 patients that were waiting for this new drug. And they were calling, and they were sort of emailing and wondering when it was going to come out. And when we really sat down as a group, we realized that in, in addition to all of our other responsibilities, um, we can only probably safely, each practitioner could probably only safely start about three people per week. Um, and that's really to offer, deliver the care that we wanted to give them and to make sure that this is going to be safe. So of course we have a limitation here. So we have all these people that want therapy, they're calling, they're asking us, um, and we, we're not going to be able to treat them all, so how are we going to allocate this resource? So we published on this uh, prior to the medications being released, and we wanted to sort of propose two different models of distribution. Um, we kind of, we, we discussed both of them. One of them is, of course, first come, first serve, and it's what I call the, the deli line where you just pick a number. So, you know, the first people into clinic, they're the ones that get it. We're not going to make any judgments about who they are, what they are. You're just, you know, you're just first in line. Um, and this is very simple, and this is what a lot of centers did when these medications came out. And actually, it's, you know, in a way, you're sort of saying, you know, we're, we're offering equal access because, you know, first come, first serve, form a line, and, and you know, we're not going to make any judgment. So, so there are some advantages. Of course, you know, when the, 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 our model was going to become very saturated very quickly after the first, you know, 20 patients came in the door and the other 480 were waiting, um, and it does ignore medical need. I mean, you're just counting every patient's medical need exactly the same. Probably doesn't work. Um, so we proposed a needs-based system uh, where we prioritize the sickest patient. We thought that you know the drugs, when the patients remember that graph that I showed you as you progress to cirrhosis, those are the patients that are most in immediate need of therapy. We were fairly easily able to identify them. We said these are the folks we should uh, we should treat first, um, and that's the system that we set up. The disadvantages: this is very complicated because it takes a lot of time to triage these patients, to contact these patients, to make sure everyone knew where they were going to be in line. So it took a lot of planning. Um, and we ran a risk that the patients who had been calling and waiting and when is the drug going to be there, when is the drug going to be there, and I just saw on the news the drug is out, and we'd say, we've got it, but you've got to wait because we're giving it to other people first. And of course, that conversation sometimes went better than others. Um, I'm sure lots of people went elsewhere to find, to find the medication. So here's our system. Uh, we uh, proposed and we, uh, we, we developed a needs-based allocation system where we divided patients into high priority and low priority. Um, and it actually turned out that by the time everyone was, uh, was seen, we were able to treat anyone that wanted therapy essentially in the first year. But something very interesting happened. What we realized, you can see here, I'll, I'll orient you, that this red bar is patients who are sicker, the advanced fibrosis patients that we treated first. And then the blue bar is the less uh, sick patients. Almost 50% of these patients, we had to stop their therapy because it was so toxic. And they never even got any benefit from the therapy. They were having a lot of adverse events. It required a lot of management. Um, and they didn't really benefit. So what do we learn from this first bottleneck is that although treating the sick as first was probably very ethically sound, um, it may not have been the best medical decision. We probably overestimated clinical trial data of outcomes and underestimated the safety data that we saw. These clinical trials had highly selected patients, very different than the patients we were actually seeing in the real world. Um, and we really, you know, we felt good. We set up a moral framework, but in reality, um, it didn't really hold up to scientific reality and it required a little bit more thought. So going back, so that was sort of what happened in 2011, and I want to briefly, in the time that I have left, talk a little bit about what's going on now. So 
If you turn on a TV in prime time, you're going to see people riding horses through the prairie talking about how their hepatitis C was cured, and this very pensive woman, you know, deciding she wants to be, and she's looking off into the distance about her hep C being cured. So there's obviously a lot of um, marketing going on right now. The, the med this medication um, was purchased for $11 billion from the company that made this, this medicine. You can see there's a lot of price tag associated. But I will tell you, it really works, and it's really safe, and you're curing a lot of people. So uh, everything is great. Here's the rub, is the cost. So the cost of this therapy is our second uh, uh, resource limitation. This is our second bottleneck. This is data from uh, four different regimens that are very, very highly effective. They're all about the same. They're all um, extremely well tolerated. And you can see on the short end, it's $60,000. That's just for a small group of patients. Uh, but on the long end, it's about $300,000 for a course of therapy for a cure. So uh, certainly a large price tag that's associated with it. Economists have looked at this. I'm not an economist, so I'll do my best here. And they have shown that compared to previous standard of care, and when you take into account the cost of someone decompensating from liver disease or maybe needing a liver transplant and all these things, uh, the, inter uh, the incremental cost-effective ratio is less than 100,000, less than 50,000 for a lot of these patients. So uh, it makes sense on an individual basis to treat this patient just from a cost standpoint alone. But remember, we have 5 million people in the United States that have hepatitis C, and we have a safe drug that you conceivably could put every single one of those patients on this drug. So a little simple uh, uh, math, and you've got yourself up to $300 billion to treat at these prices. So there's no way as a society that we're going to be able to treat all these patients. But let's go back to treating the sickest first. So this is sort of this, this default that we keep going back to. And that's exactly what's going on right now is we're treating the sickest first. And there is some merit, but there's also a lot of um, concerning issues about this. So this is data. Uh, this is a um, paper that was published just a few weeks ago in the Annals of Internal Medicine looking at Medicaid restriction policies in the United States. And to orient you, the lighter blue, this is, so most Medicaid policies will only treat if your fibrosis level is at a certain point, meaning you have to have a certain amount of scarring of your liver in order for them to pay. Um, and you can see the lighter the blue, the less scarring that you need to have. So if, you're, if you live in Maine, you barely need any liver disease in order to, for Medicaid to pay for your, for your hepatitis C medications. Sadly, you know, if you live in Illinois, we have one of the most uh, restrictive policies. You actually already need to have cirrhosis in order to get your medication paid. So forget about preventative medicine, forget about preventing disease. You actually kind of need to be on death's doorstep in order for your, your, your medication to be paid. Everybody else will be denied. And this is problematic. This is not only problematic because this may not be the right system, but this is also problematic because we have a huge disparity around the country. So it depends on where you live, what state you live in, and what Medicaid policy you have is how you're going to be treated. There's a lot of heterogeneity here, um, and there's obvious um, ethical implications of what we're doing as a society by, um, by, by restricting it in these ways. So once again, you know, we have utility and justice are at odds. Um, you know, are we creating the greatest possible good by, by treating the sickest patients? Um, but at the same time, is that at the expense of getting medications to everyone uh, and giving them equal access? So this sickest first distribution, what we learned back in 2011, is probably an oversimplification. What about the special populations? What about people that are co-infected with HIV that have a higher chance of progressing to cirrhosis? What about tra transmission? This ignores the idea that people that are now getting this virus and are not being able to treat are still transmitting the virus and they're still passing it on to other people and you're making your problem much worse. Um, and what about all the healthy patients that we're going to lose to follow up? So there's lots of patients that you know, will go to their doctor and say, your doctor will say, you know what, you're too well. You know, your Medicaid is not going to pay for you for another 15 years, and the guy says, fine, and then 20 years later, he comes back very, very ill. Those patients, in reality, will get lost over and over again. So we're missing a comprehensive framework. Now, of course, I don't have the answer, and I, I, but I'm proposing some thought that needs to go into this prior to these new medicines coming out, and sort of a way to think about this, and at least a starting point to begin these discussions. I don't have the $300 billion, but I think there's things we need to think about as these new medicines come out. So when we're thinking about cost, really thinking about what is the cost of the development of these drugs? Um, how are we dealing with pricing? So does pricing need to be regulated? And now there's a lot in the news of how much the government needs to be involved, not just state government, but on a national level, uh, with regulating pricing. 
what kind of negotiations are going on with industry? I can tell you it's not transparent. We don't know what goes on with industry right now and how different payers will negotiate and get different prices. So there's, there's issues with that. What about the science? You know, we're, they're churning out new and new drugs. We have our liver meeting this weekend, and I guarantee you there's going to be 10 new drugs and new data. Do we, do we really need all those when we can cure almost everybody? Do we really need, you know, 11 weeks instead of 12 weeks? And is that worth, you know, another $3 billion? I, I don't know if it is. Um, real world safety, you know, we kind of got burned in 2011 because clinical trial data was very different than real world data. Um, and then finally, the ethical issues. I mean, I think we all, you know, these policies are made uh, in isolation and we're not necessarily thinking of a unified ethical principle, really thinking about justice, really thinking about are we getting the drugs to the patients that need them the most, um, and are we really allowing for equal access, or at least the best we can do um, in, within, this, in, within this framework that we have. Um, so, you know, a few concluding statements that scientific discovery um, and innovation, when they are completely successful, are going to have its own set of, uh, of ethical issues. When science wins, and we're probably going to see this more and more over time, uh, we're going to have these unique types of issues, uh, and they're probably going to be rely they're going to be based in resource allocation and resource limitation. Now, I'm biased because I treat a lot of hep C, and I, and I think a lot about hepatitis C, but I think it's even just bigger than these five million people, because I think this is a test case. This is our first big time cure. If you think about it, we don't really cure that many diseases, and it's coming with a huge, huge price tag. How are we going to handle this? And I think the reason why this has gotten so much press and so many people are interested in it is because this is kind of, you know, this is going to show us how are we going to deal with these things. Yeah, you know, hepatitis C was in the news for a long time, and there was a pause for two weeks when this drug, this new uh, cholesterol medication came out that cost about $15,000 a year for this new injectable medication that's supposed to work really well. You know, these things are happening, and right now, you know, the, 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 our policies are very, very disjointed of how we're really going to handle this. Uh, so I'm advocating to have really a more thoughtful approach to taking all these things into effect of how we're going to distribute these curative uh, medications and, and, and procedures. So I'll end there. And uh, do I have time for questions? Or? OK, great. Thank you very much. So treatment of hepatitis C in the, in the prison system and how, yeah, so, you know, um, it's funny because, again, there's two comments I want to make about that. One is there's very large disparities in the United States based on which prison you go to. Um, people have said sometimes the best way to get your hep C treated is to commit a crime to go to jail for three months. It's, it's not a joke. It's sort of serious because a lot of places, actually, you can get treated. A lot of this has to do with negotiations that the state has made or whatever prison system has made with the drug companies. Um, the prison population, and especially when we're talking about patients that are in prison, we're talking about patients who, a lot of uh, intravenous drug users and patients that are very, at very high risk. Um, you know, again, these patients should, this is a very highly stigmatized population, so I think they, you know, taking it back to the paradigm, these are patients that have very limited access. So I think these are patients that, you know, we'll, when we think about justice and we think about, you know, the types of uh, therapies and medications that everybody should get, they, they are not getting this. Um, and it also sort of fulfills this utilitarian because these are probably the patients that need it the most. These are the patients that oftentimes have very advanced liver disease and also sort of as a societal benefit, these are patients that have very, very high risk of transmitting it to other patients. Um, so again, this, your, your analogy, your, your example of prison is a perfect one because this is a reservoir of infection and something where, um, in general, we've done a pretty poor job of making sure these people get access to care. Andrew, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks guys. <laughs> Uh, our, our next speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. Stacy Tesla Lindau, 
uh, an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology and medicine and geriatrics at the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Lindau received her MD degree from Brown University, completed a residency at Northwestern, and holds a master's degree in public policy uh, from the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Lindau's Dr. Lindau's um, interests are wide-ranging. Um, she investigates female aging and sexuality and urban population health improvement and fairness in health care. Uh, Dr. Lindau is the director of the program in integrative sexual medicine at the university and also directs a different program, the Southside Health and Vitality Studies uh, for the university. Uh, today, Dr. Lindau will speak to us on the topic of the ethics of sustainability. Uh, join me, please, in welcoming Stacey Lindau.